Scientists at Stanford University reportedly produced a test in the early spring of 2020, the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, and found that 96% of people who were PCR positive but without symptoms were not infectious, journalist David Zweig reports. But the test, which according to Zweig could have changed the course of the pandemic response, was never rolled out. Joining us now to tell us more is journalist and Twitter Files author David Zweig. Nice to see you, David. Nice to see you. So you are getting at the heart of a very important matter, which is this question of infectiousness, how, how contagious you might be if you had COVID. And I, I read your article, which was terrific. And it seems to me you're saying that there was a test that if that was deployed, people could, it, it would have <clears throat> potentially voided the need for many of the restrictions because people could test to know whether they're capable of passing on the disease. And that would be what we really wanted to know from people, not whether you're, you know, you're technically testing positive, but it, whether you're before or after the infectious period. Um, of course, there was a lot of concern about asymptomatic spread at the time. Uh, tell us more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> When I first came across, uh, f first became aware of this test, it kind of blew my mind. Um, as we all know, there are these PCR tests, most people are familiar with that you know, acronym for PCR. That was the test you could get at a lab or at a hospital. And, and that showed if you, quote, had um, COVID, if you were infected with SARS-CoV-2. But what it didn't tell you was, whether or not you are contagious or you know uh, infectious to other people, and this has sort of plagued um, the pandemic response from from day one. And there was an enormous push from Anthony Fauci, the CDC, um, and all sorts of people just working within public health, saying the big risk is that anyone is kind of this. I think I referred to it in my article as like a one man WMD, but unknowingly that you could have. You might not have any symptoms at all, but you could be infected, number one. And number two, you could be infected and infectious. And at Stanford, they developed a test in May of 2020, the very beginning of the pandemic, that actually could find out whether or not you were infectious um, after you had taken a regular PCR test. If it showed you were positive, they could determine whether or not that positive test meant you could actually infect others or not. So what do we know then, David, about why it was that this test wasn't rolled out? Is there any information to suggest that there was a political motive there, or are we kind of speculating uh, based on a, a perceived desire for folks to want to validate masking uh, protocols, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't speculate as to why it wasn't rolled out. You know, I, I view my job as to merely bring this to light, and you know that that's a larger conversation, perhaps something even that that investigators within the Congress or others can look into. Um, but what we do know is, to, another thing that <laughs> that blew me away was the CDC published the results of, of the early test. You know that that Stanford had developed this test. They actually published this. Um, short um, X number of months later. So they certainly were aware that this test existed. Um, and I had talked with um, several of the authors of the test, uh, authors of the uh, two different studies that they did um, related to this test. And it, you know, it was published ultimately um, by the CDC itself and other medical centers and facilities were made aware of the test. It's not clear to me, you know, why it wasn't put out more broadly. Um, but to me, again, the fascinating part is we had this tool um, to give us an answer to a question that was merely conjecture for the entire pandemic. Um, there, were all, there are all sorts of studies where we looked at, well, what is the rate of what they call asymptomatic transmission, people who don't have symptoms, what is the rate? And, and the, the answers are all over the map on that. It's very hard to tell. Um, we do know uh, at the World Health Organization, one of the um, top officials there quite early said, um, it's, quote, very rare. Um, interestingly, the next day, because there was a lot of pressure, um, the World Health Organization walked her statement back, and she uh, later said it's very complex. Um, but there are a number of studies that, um, that showed that asymptomatic transmission was not particularly likely. There were some other studies, particularly modeling the, these mathematical models, um, that showed that it was a very large percentage. But again, a mathematical model is really only as good as, it, as the inputs put into the model. So ultimately, it's really, as, as I wrote, it's just a guesstimate. 
What's amazing about the Stanford test, this is not observational data, this is not epidemiological, this is a biological test. You give it to someone and they either are or they are not contagious. Hmm. Uh, you know, we've talked uh, a lot on the show about failures of the CDC, even failures relating to testing early on. There was the issue of the test that they authorized that then had some problem with, put us you know, behind the curve on uh, getting ready to do, to do testing nationally. Um, you know, is this, could this be chalked up to another kind of, you know, <laughs> deeply unfortunate and irresponsible miscommunication going on at the Centers for Disease Control when they should have been, you know, this was their moment. This was their moment to shine. This is the thing they prepare for. They're the agency that's supposed to charter our course through a pandemic, a rare event, and were they asleep at the wheel? It, it certainly seems so, and 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 not just the CDC, but I, I would certainly think Anthony Fauci and NIAID, his agency. I mean, they they you know were very much um, running the show in a lot of regards. He certainly was uh, in the media, you know, constantly as a constant presence, talking about um, the potential of people without symptoms um, to infect others. This was the you know Andrew Cuomo, your mess protects me, my mess protects you. This whole thing we don't know. Um, yet a test existed that could give us that answer, and it was not rolled out in any large manner. Basically, as far as I'm aware, I might be wrong, uh, maybe it was picked up at a few other places, it basically remained at Stanford. Um, and then they ultimately, which we can talk about, did a second study um, related to the results of the test, which is to me the, you know, an equal bombshell about what they actually found um, for the actual rate of people who were positive who um, were not actually infectious. So this was a PCR test, right? The kind of test that not you can't do it at home. You have to go into a facility. They take your swab. They have to amplify the num the amount of uh, product and you know the the biomaterial through the p polymerase chain reaction process, and then they do a test, right? So I'm I'm just a little curious about what the practical impl implications were going to be, given that most people, as I understand it. We're not going in to get those kinds of official tests, unless, of course, you were working at a job that required kind of a, a that more official kind of imprimatur of, of safety. So, if it's the case that most people aren't actually going to avail themselves of this kind of test, how much impact would that have had on masking guidance and the like, which has to accommodate what the majority of the population are going to to do? To do? Yeah, it's such a good question. You know, who knows? Um, but what we do know is millions and millions and millions of PCR tests um, have been given. You're right, it's not as uh, convenient or easy to do as someone having you know, the rapid tests at home, but um, for, uh, for me, because I've written about children in schools um, so much over the last few years, um, I think about a kid who's you know, compelled to stay home out of school because they tested positive, um, often on a PCR test. This would have given them the opportunity, once if you had tested positive on PCR, well, let's give them this special, uh, what's called a minus strand test. Um, it's a little bit complicated how this worked, but they, there was a special thing called a minus strand. And if they saw evidence of the minus strand, that showed that, the, um, that showed that the virus was replicating. And if you have a replicating virus, then it can be infectious. If it's not replicating, not infectious. So, you know, if, if you're a kid and you're home from school and the parents, it would behoove them, well, let's go to, you know, your local medical center or, you know, a Quest lab or whatever and have them do the test and you can get an answer um, and get the kid back in school. People who didn't visit um, relatives, um, people who didn't go to work, these are all things, right, not as easy as just doing you know, a home test, but certainly better than not having an answer at all because some people remain um, positive and infectious for weeks and weeks. You could still keep showing up as positive and people didn't know what to do. Um, so this would have provided just another tool um, that in, in the toolbox for us on how we could handle the pandemic. And, and briefly before we let you go, can you mention the potential implication you wrote about in your piece uh, for hospitals and procedures that were being delayed because of, of, of patients testing positive? Right. So the initial impetus for even creating this test was they were just thinking about it in a clinical setting in a hospital. You had patients who tested positive. Um, they didn't have symptoms and they had surgeries were put off, other types of procedures, chemotherapy. All this stuff was delayed until these people could test negative. But these were really, you know, sometimes life-saving procedures or, or, or um, other operations or things that were happening that were 
that were put off and unnecessarily so, even the isolation type of uh, procedures put into place for patients who tested positive, but it was really just a fragment of, uh, uh, of material in there. It's what we would almost think about one of the disease specialists I spoke to said, this is kind of like leaving a, um, uh, a hair at a crime scene. It was a fragment indicating something had happened, but it was no longer a problem. And I just want to get in real quick. The other amazing thing about this story is in the second study they did, they found out that for a great duration of, of the study period of the pandemic over a couple years, only 4% of the people who didn't have symptoms, who tested positive, actually had even the capability of infecting someone else. So 96% of people who tested positive had no capability whatsoever of infecting someone else. And of course, most people who well, don't have symptoms don't have COVID to begin with. But, but David, so we're talking I mean, about a subgroup that, of a subgroup. That's not, that percentage, the, that overwhelming percentage of people who tested positive with no symptoms, not having the ability to transmit, isn't 90 odd percent of everybody who gets COVID, because most people who get COVID have symptoms, I presume, right? So we're talking about a smaller section, you know, a small percentage of people who get COVID never have symptoms, and then a smaller subset of that were never transmitted, uh, uh, could never transmit in the first place, right? I just want to be clear right. about the cohort we're talking about. Right. So when, the, the way I, I try to explain it in the article is if you imagine, you know, if you're in a classroom with kids, um, there's 20 kids in there and there aren't any symptoms. Well, most people in life, if we don't have symptoms, most people are healthy. It's because they don't have COVID to begin with. Then there's some portion of people who have COVID, but don't have symptoms. And what they found in this Stanford study is that of the people who actually tested positive for COVID, but didn't have symptoms, 96% of them had no capability of transmitting to other people to begin with. So you're talking about, we were walking around, everyone was afraid, this person seems healthy, but they could infect me. Well, of course, most people who seem healthy is because they are healthy. Then a small portion of people who are actually infected, but without symptoms, you have those people. And then of those people, something like 4% or 5% actually ha even had the capability. And one of the people I spoke to said, look, just because you have that capability, that still doesn't mean that they were going to infect other people. That's just they were technically capable. They still may not have had enough replicating virus to actually infect someone else. It just means that they were even technically capable of doing this. So what all of these data show is to my mind, and, and I spoke with a bunch of people before I posted the piece because it seemed so crazy to me, I needed to fact check myself, was that the notion of this wildly rampant idea of people without symptoms potentially infecting other people was wildly overblown. And the idea that kids were kept out of school, everyone had to wear a mask all the time, mm -hmm. everyone had to distance, was based on this idea that we didn't know. But if we had done the simple, the sort of classic, if you're sick, stay home, I think we largely would have ended up in the same place. Mm. Fascinating. David Zweig, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me.